So, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, what I am going to do is to explain a little bit how I, as an environmental activist, how we are evaluating the situation and what kind of solutions we are working on. And uh, this is a scenario we made back in 2008, after the International Climate Panel said the target is not 50% reduction the next 40 years, it's 80. Very many of the politicians focus on lifestyle changes, and that's good. We should all do what we could, but it's very difficult to find scientific literature. What I started to work on then was, hmm, if it's worse than we think, what are we going to do then? And in the finance sector, they always have an exit strategy. Do we have that in the environmental sector? And we have tried to work out that in Bologna Foundation, and that's our carbon negative strategy. And I will, with so short time, I will only be able to give you some input. But the important part for me is that I'm only working with the solutions that could take us all the way to the goal. Because we start to come one investment cycle away, and therefore it's extremely important that we are not trapped in wrong directions, that is not taking us all the way to the goal. So one of the things we saw in 2008 was we had been working then since 92, 93 with carbon capture and storage. If you should be able to go up to 80% reduction, we really need to look at combining carbon capture and storage with bioenergy, because bioenergy is carbon neutral, and if you capture and store the CO2, you go carbon negative. Um, in the last year, I've been, been since 2007, been vice chairing the European Technology Platform for Carbon Capture and Storage. I'm the board of the Biofuel Platform, and I'm also the chairman of the Commission's Task Force on BioCCS. The last one and a half year, I've been working as an advisor for Commissioner Oettinger on the Roadmap 2050. It's 27 heads of states that has decided that Europe is going to cut their CO2 emissions with 80% the next 40 years. And that's going to happen within the Union, independent of an international agreement. One argument for this is the climate. The other is definitely that last year, EU imported only oil for 240 billion euros. And that's more than the whole deficit of Greece. And as you all know, that's a lot of money. Um, if you're going to cut the CO2 emissions with 80%, you have to make a 100% plan, because if we only miss 20% in such a big task, we are very good. So we work with a range of different environmental solutions. We know that solar, wind, CCS, and biomass is crucial to combat global warming and poverty. And I encourage people to go ahead, be early movers and risk takers. So when we are building a new office building in Oslo, there is no chance. I have to be best, and we are very proud of being the best and most energy efficient building in Norway so far. And I said, and I hope someone beats us, maybe it will happen up here in Trondheim, they will get a bottle of Bologna wine from me. Uh, because that's the intention. Not to do anything so exclusive that it could not be duplicated, but we wanted to build a, a, a company building that was possible for other people to do from an economic aspect. Um, down there you see uh, the first supply ship on LNG with fuel cell. It's another initiative and a way we work together with the business. But I had never worked with liquid natural gas if it was not possible to use biomass in the future to produce bio-liquid natural gas, because then if that was not possible, I could not defend even if it makes short time good results, I could not defend all the investments in this infrastructure. And there you see another of my favorite, that's the electrical cars. It's a fantastic uh, time we are moving into. The electrical car starts to be really cool. And uh, when I got, became 40 years old, I decided to have a midlife crisis. And I was very lucky to buy an electrical sports car, which is much more fun than these boring fossil fuel cars that doesn't move. This goes three to, uh, zero to 100 seconds, zero to 100 uh, kilometers in 3.5 seconds. 
So it's really fun. There's only maybe one or two Maserati that beats me in Norway. And it's good to be an environmental activist and be able to do things like that also. So we work with a range on this, but if I in the future could power my electrical car from a biopower plant with carbon capture and storage, I remove more CO2 each kilometer I drive. It's a very good US solution. To be able to use energy smarter, I think that the potential uh, that the electrical cars represent to balance unregulated power production like wind and solar is fantastic. And I understood it when I saw the amount of energy that was away in US during the financial, cars, financial crisis. Before the financial crisis, they had three quarters of a tank. During the financial crisis, it was one quarter. And if you add up those 200 million cars, that's an enormous amount of energy. And to be able in the future to use the electrical cars in a two-way communication with the buildings is an enormous market and will help us a lot to achieve a renewable energy society. But I'm, I'm quite radical. So I don't believe in a 100% renewable energy society. It's not enough for me. Because if I do it only with wind and solar, if we are too late, or if the greenhouse effect is worse than we thought, I'm really bad off if I've taken down some of the coal power plants that I could do coal firing with bio and turn the biggest emitters to the biggest weapon we have to combat global warming. So, for me, it's important to go from vision to reality in many different topics, and we do that in Bologna. We bought our first electrical car in 89. We are in the most energy efficient building in Norway. We are working with the first supply ship on fuel cells. We try to not only, and, and we are very clear, I'm not only a consultant, I'm a quite heavy activist. I can be arrested any time if it's the right issue, and I still do that even if I start to be old. Oil drilling in the Arctic, I'm in. But it's not enough to talk about the problems, it's not enough to talk about the solutions. It's time for the environment movement to carry out the solutions. Um, so, this idea is in my head all the time. And when you're not listening to me, you maybe think I'm crazy. That's true. But the challenge we are facing is even more crazy. So we have to dare to go out of the box a little bit and look for some crazy solutions. So, we did a study two years ago, together with the National Energy Agency and the ECOFIS, telling that with the existing infrastructure, if we combined bio and coal and CCS, we could remove three and a half gigaton yearly of CO2 with sustainable biomass. That's a lot. That's, uh, uh, ten, uh, that if we are 30 gigaton emissions today, expecting to go up to 45 in the next 40 years, this is a lot. But if I had enough biomass, I could remove much more CO2 out of the atmosphere. So, we started a search for biomass. And we had a big conference in 2008 in preparation for a Copenhagen negotiation, because the interesting thing with biomass is that if you could produce that by solar or wind in Africa or other developing countries, you're not dependent on large-scale grid system to export your electricity. You could transform it and store it in biomass and you have the whole world market. However, so we drank algae, that was the first time people laughed at us, that's also creating good environment. Uh, but we have been on the hunt, where can we produce new types of biomass? And uh, we have got a lot of attention, here's the king in Jordan, uh, welcoming us to Jordan in a project. I'm going now next week with the Norwegian Crown Prince to continue that. Uh, here we are in, uh, in signing an agreement. We are, uh, we are working on, on a range of scales. And I try to give an impression on what we're doing on this topic. So we have forest, uh, now desert problems in Norway also. We don't see them. But the way seaweed 
disappear on the Norwegian coast. There's a lot of tons of CO2. So we are now into studies and projects on looking at how could we do integrated fish farming projects where we grow seaweed around to take care of the waste and the nutrition that's left over. And if you grow seaweed close to a, uh, to a fish farm facility, the seaweed will grow 50% more. And if it did this around all fish farming facilities in Norway, we would produce around 2 million tons of biomass every, year, every day, day. It's an enormous amount. And when you look at the new potential with offshore wind and things like that, we think that this also represents new possibilities to create the infrastructure for ocean first project, as we call it. This is just in the beginning. We are curious, but we are doing something with it. So we have now started two projects, one in the Hardangefjord together with the uh, Ocean Research Institute in uh, Bergen and with Sintef and Beloma. This is to grow seaweed around a fish farm in Hardangefjord and together with the fish farming company Lere, we are doing uh, um, uh, a project also in Lysefjord. So we are now up with two projects in Norway and I will not have a result this summer. Give me two, three years, and I will tell you if this, this is a project that has potential. But if you grow seaweed, mussels, and so on around the fish farms, you get an enormous economic benefit for the fish farm that becomes much more healthy. You go from a monoculture to a multiculture. You have uh, billions of crones in potential value. And you have a very suitable infrastructure in the fish farming industry that could be transferred directly into this activity and you could do the job with the seaweed production when you're not doing the job at the fish farming. So this is a huge potential. Um, upwelling is another topic that we work a lot with. We see examples from tests in Lysefjord that if we do upwelling with a 60 kilowatt pump under a mussel farm, that 60 kilowatt pump will increase the growth because you get more nutrition up to the, to the plankton. And that muscle farm will bind CO2 equal from the yearly emission of nine, uh, six to 9,000 cars. It's a very energy efficient way of binding CO2. And this is, again, if we need an exit strategy, this could be options that we could take into use. So maybe the future will look like this. It's important to have some visions. And it's important to look what is coming in a long time perspective. And uh, many of the offshore wind farms are struggling with the conflict of the fisheries. This will create enormous new habitats for fisheries and will uh, support the fishing activities. So we make a win-win situation instead of a conflict. This is another way to think. And this is maybe the most interesting thing I'm working with. Uh, it's called the Sahara Forest Project. It's a result of, uh, and you will meet Michael Paulin later this session, we met some years ago uh, under a Google Sitegeist conference in London, and we have been working since then. Because we will achieve energy uh, efficiency increase in many of the different new technologies, but maybe the biggest potential is where we can get technologies to work together. So this project is all about to use what we have enough of to produce what we need more of. We have enough CO2, we have enough sun, we have enough nutrition, we have enough desert. We need electricity, we need fresh water, we need food, we need biomass, and we need revegetation. How do we do this? When we did our major study in 2008, we saw that fresh water was very conflicting and increasing because of global warming. So this is a result of that we have been investigating heavily how could you produce biomass for the future by seawater. Um, to say that, this is 
many different technologies. It's concentrated solar power. They need cooling. We cannot use up the fresh water in North Africa to cool these facilities. We can cool them with seawater. The seawater gets warm, we get waste heat. We bring that waste heat into greenhouses that could use this waste heat to evaporate. These greenhouses evaporate seawater to produce fresh water and cool the environment. We could produce biomass that produce biogas that runs the turbines in the concentrated solar power during the night, so it could be base load. We could use the CO2 from that turbines, biogas turbines to feed the algae. The algae increase the, their growth with five times. And this is the way we try to work with synergies between different technologies. And, and you will understand more uh, behind the thinking of biomimicry, which Michael Paulin has been a huge and big inspirator for this project. We are now uh, done our studies, both for Qatar and Jordan. Um, in Jordan, we have got a big piece of land, 12 kilometers inside. We're going to build the seawater pipeline 50 meters from the Israeli border, 12 kilometers inland. Um, it's a desert there. And uh, yes, there could be environmental consequences on what we are doing. So just now we are carrying out environmental impact studies. In Qatar, we are already in the ground. There we are cooperating with Yara and Kafko, two of the biggest fertilizers company in the world. And what we're doing there is that we are evaporating seawater with very concentrated salt outdoor. And outdoor there, we are cooling the air with 8 degrees, and we create a humid environment. The reason for this is that many places where you produce fresh water with osmosis, you get a brine, you increase the salt level from, from uh, three and a half to seven percent, you put it out and you destroy the sea. We dry the salt completely. We are partnering up now. This is an example on, on one of our partners uh, built in Australia with Seawater Greenhouse, one of the technologies that we are working on. They are now producing tomatoes for the commercial market on seawater. It's quite fantastic and no oil. And when you know that tomatoes from Spain is four or five kilo of oil per kilo of tomato, this is the future for agriculture. This year, we signed an agreement then with Yara and Kafko. Uh, so we have got money to build in Qatar, and we are in a hurry. So we are going to build this. Oops, it's something wrong with the, with the, with the foil there. But this is going to be ready before the climate negotiations in Qatar in November. So we are working. This is a 10,000 square meter laboratory where we try, and you see here, the concentrated solar power here. This is outdoor vegetation in humid air because we are evaporating seawater producing salt. This is uh, solar parks, algae ponds, different kind of greenhouses that we have developed that is evaporating seawater and producing fresh water. You get also humid air out behind these greenhouses, so you get a kind of oasis effect in the desert. Yes, this is crazy, but it's very, very fun. And we will produce new kind of fertilizer for the desert and for the greenhouse in this. It's an enormous potential. And at the end, it's not Norway, it's a rich country that's going to put out the last gigatons of CO2 in the atmosphere to earn money. It's the developing countries that should have that possibility. So, what happens? If you look at Egypt, you have Qatar depression. It's under seawater level. It's huge. If I could, and I'm crazy, if I could employ 40 million Egyptians to produce algae, and it's 40 million Egyptians with less than $2 a day, I think we could start to talk about binding gigatons of CO2 every year. And if we could take that biomass, and for example, that the European power sector, and Europe has to look at the CO2 emissions as a bank loan that we have to pay back with an interest. We have to go carbon negative. We solve the climate challenge with trade instead. 
all the CO2 that we bind in the biomass, and so this is the future. So maybe my ship goes on bio liquid natural gas from Sahara in the, forest, uh, in, in the future. Maybe my car goes carbon negative. Maybe the whole answer of the melting of the Arctic, melting of the Arctic, is in Sahara. So for me, this is a bright future. It's a different future. And it's very inspiring to work for this every day because the future is going to be carbon negative. Thank you.